another city, but he was imprisoned by Ormazdas, the governor of that province, who ordered Melas to adore the sun. When the saint refused, Homorzdas mockingly asked him to reveal his beliefs. But Milas refused to disclose sacred mysteries to impure ears. Hormizdas then stabbed the bishop with his brother's help. But before expiring, Milas made a terrible prophecy against the assassins. The next day, the two brothers fatally wounded each other while hunting, which fulfilled the prophecy and filled the people with astonishment throughout the country. The body of the martyr was brought to Malcolm Castle and buried there, and in the wars that came, the Arabs never conquered this castle, which was considered a miracle attributed to the remains of the saint that rested there. St. Milas was a Persian warrior who did not lose the soul of a warrior, but kept it intact when he became a bishop. He was dealing with a very evil people, but he never gave up preaching. His bravery in the face of danger and his unwavering faith are inspiring. The story of this saint teaches us that even in the face of evil, we should not be discouraged from our mission to spread the word of God. We can draw inspiration from his life and learn to be true shepherds who fight for their flock when necessary. Saint Milas, pray for us. Now, good morning to you. Praise be to God. It is a beautiful day on Catholic Radio. And good morning to you. I hope you are doing well. I hope your weekend was blessed. I hope it was very fruitful. I hope it was restful. Didn't get any too much uh, going on. Got to uh, take a deep breath, especially on Sunday. I hope you were able to abstain from work on Sunday. That is such a grace and attend Holy Mass. Uh, but speaking of uh, attending Holy Mass, uh, our producer, good morning to you, Tito. Good morning, Adrian. What's going on today? Oh, so much, so much. How was your weekend? It was full from uh, friend, uh, God children receiving their first uh, communion and confirmation to uh, catching up with old, old friends and uh, doing service projects and uh, all for the glory of God. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. That sounds like a great time. Yes. You know, over the, the weekend, actually, I saw this movie. The movie is called, I don't know, You maybe you've heard of it came out in like 1987, I think. The movie is Over the Top with Sylvester Stallone. And the, this movie was actually recommended to me by my friend Angie, and which is kind of funny because she's younger than me. And so <laughs> it's like this movie, 1987 movie, but we were talking about Sylvester Stallone, and she was like, you gotta see Over the Top. You're gonna love this movie. If you like Sylvester Stallone, if you like the Rocky series, you gotta see it. So I watched it. And I really enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it. It was a, it was such a like a pro dad film. It's yes. very pro dad. The, the, the special alone is a he left his 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 wife and his kid, and you're like, oh, that sounds terrible. And yeah, that's bad. But the whole thing is a is a redemption arc where he's trying to return to his family, trying to become a father again, trying to take responsibility for his actions. And in the meantime, there's like an arm wrestling competition going on in the as a backstory. I, it's a great movie. It's a great movie. It's an arm wrestling movie. It is. It's an arm wrestling movie. So <laughs> I was, uh, I really, really enjoyed it. So thank you to my friend Angie for that recommendation. Also, speaking of friends, my friend Nelia corrected me last week about Modelo, which I wanted to correct because it's interesting. Uh, maybe during the after show, we can have a discussion about this. But here's uh, what I learned. In 2013, Constellation acquired Grupo Modelo's U.S. beer business from Anheuser-Busch granting independent control over the U.S. commercial business in a brewery in Mexico, giving them exclusive perpetual brand license in the U.S. for Corona and the Modelo brands, allowing them to import, market, and sell them for the U.S. market. So I'd be curious about that because Corona, I there's they have a giant Corona sign on the Anheuser-Busch uh, buildings. I drove past an Anheuser-Busch building this weekend, and I, there's a giant Corona sign on the front of it. So I'm like, hmm, how does that work? So maybe we can discuss this during the after show. Coming up in the show this morning, at 15 past the hour, we're going to be talking about the BLM protest erupting in New York City after a homeless man died after being choked on the subway. And we're also discuss a New York City Catholic church facing backlash for, quote, God is trans exhibit. Very, very concerning. We'll talk about that. Plus, some good news, a victory over the purported Catholic Joe Biden. So that'll be an interesting tour story to share with you. So very good. At 30 past the hour, Steve Ray is joining us to discuss the case of the disappearing Christians in the Holy Land. 
Is it a giant magic trick or something more nefarious <laughs> coming along? We'll discuss that at 30 past the hour with Steve Ray. In the next hour, I'm going to share with you an article from Crisis Magazine titled A Case for American Monarchy. I think it's a fun conversation to have, especially with uh, the King Charles coronation. So we'll talk about all of that from a Catholic perspective. It'll be a very interesting conversation. Plus, as always, we have our Fear and Trembling game show with prizes. So you're going to want to tune in for all of that. Won't want to miss not one moment of it. A very jam-packed show. So stay tuned for the whole show. Now let's begin with prayer as is our custom. We're going to pray to the Blessed Virgin as it is the month of May dedicated to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I want to pray in a special way for my friend. He uh, sent me a, a text message last night or yesterday afternoon about the, his nephew, Peter Gabriel Navarro, who was born 26 weeks old and he would be in the NICU for three months. Pray for his safety and pray that he be, uh, that he doesn't, that he survives uh, during this time, that's very uh, concerning. So we we'll definitely be praying for Peter Gabriel Navarro. And of course, uh, I want to say a prayer for my friend Angie, the one who recommended that movie to me. She was also the one who I was uh, took me around in California. So prayers for her for uh, in Thanksgiving for all that help and the, the hospitality that I received in California. So let's begin. We'll pray the Subtuum Presidium, a prayer that was written in the third century. Can you believe it? It's dedicated to Our Lady. We'll pray that prayer in Latin and then in English. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Subtuum presidium confugimus sancta dei genitrix, nostras deprecationes ne despicias in necitatibus sed a periculis cuntis, libra nos semper virgo gloriosa et benedicta. We fly to thy protection, O Holy Mother of God. Despise not our petitions and our necessities, but deliver us always from all dangers, O glorious and blessed Virgin. Amen. In the name of the Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And now your headline news with Tito Edwards. Thank you so very much, Adrian. Thank you for that prayer, beautiful prayer. Good morning. You are listening to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. Today is Monday, May 8th, in the year of our Lord, 2023. And these are our headlines for today. OSV News is reporting Dallas Bishop Ed Burns addressed the faithful of the diocese with a heavy heart late May 6 after at least eight people, including a child, was killed during a mass shooting that afternoon at an outlet in Allen, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas. Authorities said a gunman opened fire at the Allen Premium Outlets, a Dallas area outlet mall, killing eight and winning at least another seven people before being killed by police. CatholicCulture.org and the New York Post is reporting a God is Trans exhibit at New York City Parish raises eyebrows. The Church of St. Paul the Apostle is the mother church of the Paulist Fathers. According to the report, which includes photographs and an artist's description, God is Trans was displayed next to a side altar dedicated to St. Agnes. Catholic News Agency is reporting Ireland is preparing to enact a broader ban on hate crimes and hate speech as critics warn of effects on freedom of expression. Commentator Dubaltak Erichtenen, writing in the UK newspaper Catholic Herald, Herald in November, voiced concern that the law could be used to prosecute priests or laity who voice Catholic teaching. And finally, Breitbart News is reporting for black residents in California are forecasted to cost $800 billion, about 2500 per person in the U.S., more than twice the cost of the state's entire annual budget. But activists say that is not enough. These are reparations for black residents in California, which sided with the union during the Civil War. Those were your headlines this morning. May God bless you all. The gospel of the day comes from John chapter 14, verses 21 through 26. The man who loves me is the man who keeps the commandments he has from me. And he who loves me will win my father's love, and I too will love him, and will reveal myself to him. Here Judas, not the Iscariot, said to him, Lord, who comes it that thou wilt reveal thyself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If a man has any love for me, he will be true to my word, and then he will win my father's love, and he will both come to him and make our continual abode with him. Whereas the man who has no love for me lets my saying pass him by. And this word which you have been hearing from me comes not from me, but from my Father who sent me. So much converse I have held with you, I still at your side. 
He who is to befriend you, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send on my account, will in his turn make everything plain and recall to your minds everything I have said to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing to note here is this is Judas, not the Iscariot. This is Judas, the, you know, from uh, St. Jude, St. Jude, the one who wrote one of the epistles, that St. Jude. And we, they actually have the same name, Judas, but we call him Jude as to distinguish him from Judas, the Iscariot, the one who betrayed our Lord. A very uh, unfortunate uh, <laughs> to be, to have that association. Uh, verse 22, Cornelius Lapide here says, he asked the reason, says St. Augustine, wherefore he will not manifest himself to the world, but only to his own. The Lord answered him, because these love, but the others do not love. Judas uses the word manifest because Christ had just used the same expression, saying, I will manifest myself to him. This word, therefore, dwelt in Judas's mind, through though he is referring to previous words of Christ. Now, in verse 23, he responds, Do not suppose, O Judas, that I will appear to thee alone and thy fellow apostles after my resurrection, as if the fruit of my life and passion were restricted to you only and a few others to whom I shall visibly appear. I shall appear, though invisibly, to all those who throughout the world shall receive my faith and doctrine by means of the preaching of thyself and the rest of the apostles, and shall love and keep it. Now, this is important because he says that if you love God, you will keep his commandments, right? This is what is being implied here in verse 23. Jesus answered him, if a man has any love for me, he will be true to my word. And then he will win my father's love and we will both come to him and make our continual abode with him. Whereas the man who has no love for me lets my saying pass him by. This is the same kind of word that he says elsewhere that those who love God will keep his commandments. So if you do not love God, you do not keep his commandments, which is as much as Cornelius Alapide says in verse 24, when he says, he that loveth me not the reason then why anyone does not keep God's commandments is because he loveth not God. This is very important because many people claim to be followers of Christ. People will say that I am of Christ. People will say, Lord, Lord. But remember, our Lord said, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven because you have to love. Love is the greatest commandment. It is the commandment in which everything else is built upon. The first two commandments, love God and second is like unto it, love neighbor. But how can you love God if you do not keep his commandments? So if someone says they love God, but they are pro-death, they are anti-life, they are against all the teachings of the church, they do not submit to the Holy Mother Church in uh, her teachings, well, then how can they truly say they love God? A very, very important thing to note. Now, lastly, the piously, the thus piously writes St. Bernard, Blessed is he with whom thou wilt make thine abode, O Lord. Blessed is he in whom wisdom builds herself a house, hewing out her seven pillars. Blessed is the soul which is the seat of wisdom. What is that soul? It is the soul of the just. Rightly so, for judgment and justice are the preparation of thy seat. Who is there among you, brethren, who desires to prepare in his soul a seat for Christ? Lo, what are the silks, the tapestries, the cushions which ought to be prepared? Justice and judgment, he says, are the preparation of thy seat. Justice is the virtue which is his very own and which he gives to each. Render thus to each of the three classes of thy superiors, thy equals, thy inferiors, which is due to them. Thus shalt thou worthily celebrate the coming of Christ and prepare his seal and justice. So let us prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ. Hey, Donnie, name four of the seven sacraments. Baptism, confession. That's right, reconciliation. Communion and confirmation. As parents, we're the primary educators of our Catholic faith to our children. And if you don't know your Catholic faith as well as you should, that's okay. Just tune in daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network by logging online to grnonline.com. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Listen, learn, love, and pass it on. 
Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your One Minute Tool for Catholic Evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Since you may not agree that the New Testament came to us through the oral tradition of the apostles, how do you believe it did come to us? So here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a language aid. In Latin, the word tradition is a verb, not a noun. It's the act of handing over. Handing over what? Handing over the faith. You see, capital T tradition continues to answer the questions the Bible doesn't explicitly answer. For example, you've noticed that contraception or doctor-assisted suicide and many other crucial human topics are not laid out in the Bible. Secondly, analogous to baseball, the totality of baseball has been handed on to each generation. This is very different than just the small t tradition of saying not flipping the bat after hitting a home run. And thirdly, in case you're trying to rid church traditions to be non-traditional, just know that capital T tradition is what got you to Jesus. Drop kicking small religious traditions to be considered non-traditional is like the dog chasing his tail. His task is never fruitless and thoroughly silly. And welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. So much stories in the news. It's kind of ridiculous, honestly. I'm like, there is about a dozen stories I want to get to, where we might get to about three of them, is my my guess. Uh, but let's start with some good news. We have such bad news every day. Let's start with some uh, a victory. So we had this great victory that came up. You might remember last week we were talking about the fact that there was a story where Joe Biden's administration was wanting to try to stop having the sanctuary light at Catholic hospitals. Now, there's an update to that story. The Biden administration has backed down from attempting to force a Catholic hospital to extinguish a sanctuary candle or risk losing federal funding. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has ordered St. Francis Health System to snuff out two sanctuary candles threatening accreditation and fundraising and funding. However, after receiving a letter from the Beckett Law Firm in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the HHS informed the hospital that it could continue its religious practice while following safety protocols. The CEO of the health system expresses gratitude for the support received and highlighted the importance of the sanctuary candle in reflecting their commitment to serving patients with religious devotion. So that's some good news. We, there is a victory. Praise be to God. It's always good to uh, to celebrate when we get some uh, some wins, and so let's uh, let's celebrate that. Say a prayer in Thanksgiving that that continued there. Uh, it's always good to push back on these things because we can in fact have victories. Uh, we should not be people with no hope because we can gain ground. So on to bad news. Some bad news is the story about this homeless man who w- died after being choked out on the subway. And there is a lot of very interesting things that happen in uh, response to this. Now, BLM protest erupts in New York City over a homeless man who died after being choked on the subway. This is very concerning because the Black Lives Matter are trying to turn this situation into another George Floyd situation. Now, of course, we know with the George Floyd situation, the the police officer who has now been arrested and is being uh, he's in prison never actually knelt on his neck. We Many people probably are not even aware of that because of the ginormous media campaign against this police officer. His uh, knee was actually on his shoulder blade. It looked like it was on his neck from the cameras from people and the phones in the front. But once we saw the footage from the back, it was clear that his knee was not actually on his neck. And so the guy died, George Floyd died from a fentanyl overdose not from being uh, choked out, not from being having a knee on his neck. That's correct. He was heavily drugged. He was he was going nuts in that in his overdose. And so the thing that's uh, interesting about this story was we haven't talked about this yet. And the reason why I haven't talked about it is because I'm waiting for all the information to come out because I do not trust anything that anybody says. I want to know more about what happened here because. It very clearly, what happened, uh, what we do know for sure is that this man, Neely, was a vagrant, that he was screaming in an aggressive manner, that he was, that he's been known to attack people. There has been several, several stories of this man having trying to push uh, passengers onto the train, uh, the tracks, to get run over, that the guy was clearly incredibly mentally ill, and that this man was uh, like assaulting people, at the least verbally assaulting people, in the subway where they were trapped inside. It's not like anybody can go anywhere. And this Marine comes up behind him to subdue him. They, he puts him in a chokehold, and other passerbys, passengers, 
help hold him down, and he dies in the process. Now, this is a complicated story because there's a question of how much force should they be exerted. There's multiple people trying to subdue him. Okay, well, all these things will be will be taken into account and will happen. However, this is a it's very concerning to me that these stories come up and that people immediately start attacking this man, this Marine, and trying to ruin his life and throw him in prison for life because he went out of his way. He was a hero. He went out of his way to defend the people on the train. Now, this person had, uh, this person Neely has, uh, has uh, a rap sheet already. He should have been in prison. If the New York State, the New York City, would have enforced the laws in their city, this man would still be alive. He would not be dead today if they had just enforced their laws. He would be in prison, but he would be alive. Now, this is, I put that on them first and foremost. Now, the situation with the Marine, I think, is concerning because, yes, there could be a debate on whether or not he gave a sufficient amount of force. However, in a situation like that, I'm not going to judge this man uh, based on the information we have. I'm not going to judge this man because he sprung into action to defend innocent people. Now, if we start persecuting people, and I do mean persecute rather than prosecute, persecuting these people who try to defend others, what do you create? You create a culture where nobody wants to defend anyone, where if we see somebody that's in danger, what's going to go through our minds? We're going to be thinking to ourselves, hmm, if I step in and I try to help this person, and if I give too much force, uh, whatever is deemed too much force by the culture, if I'm the wrong skin color and the person that is uh, being uh, is attacking someone is the wrong skin color, then my whole life could be ruined. First, I'm going to be risking my own life and uh, confronting the person to begin with, because I don't know, maybe this person has a knife, a gun, or something. I'm going to be endangering my own life. But not only that, even if I survive, there's going to be cameras on me. People are going to accuse me of attacking this innocent person. I'm going to, my life could be ruined. My, I could lose my job. My kids can be doxxed. People can send death threats to my family. And then, and if, then if I accidentally kill the guy in the process, which I don't want, I don't want to kill the guy, but I recognize that it's a possibility if I, we engage in these circumstances, there's always a possibility. It's a foreseen but unintended consequence. Well, then what's going to happen? Well, then I may go to prison for life. I may get prosecuted for murder. And so what are most people going to do? We are creating a culture of cowards. We are encouraging cowardice and discouraging heroism. We are discouraging courage and for the sake of this misaligned idea of prudence. This is why this is an important story. Now, obviously, this uh, Marine, he, he, he killed the guy. It seems as though he killed the guy. It has been ruled a homicide, which does not, a, a, does not mean that, it was, that this was a murder. It means that he, the person died by man. That's what the word homicide literally means. Homo meaning man, side meaning the death of. So it was death by a man. So that's what it, it is uh, a homicide. And, but his guilt has to, be, has to be determined in the court of law. In fact, originally the police let him go because it was clear that this man was uh, standing his ground, was defending other people, was a, was, was a hero. So this is why this is a problem. Now, this is also a thing we see whenever there are gun laws. There was a story last week. Uh, I don't remember if we talked about it. We did not talk about it. ran out of time. Uh, but yeah, last week there was a story. The old woman, you may remember this story, this old woman who during the BLM protest was driving through the city and she was surrounded by BLM protesters and out of fear for her life, she stepped on the gas and ran over a couple of the BLM protesters to get away. And now she was just freed. This was in Texas, by the way. This was in Texas. This is, a, this is not some liberal state. This was in Texas. Now she was uh, put in, she was prosecuted for this. And they let her go with the punishment of five hours of community service. Immediately, tons of people were celebrating, see, saying, see, look, it's a victory. It's a victory. This was not a victory because she, was, she had had to admit to guilt. Because by giving her five hours of community service to say, hey, look, we understand you're, you're guilty, but we're going to be merciful to you because we understand the circumstances. So we're going to plead down the situation. So this is a loss. This is an L. 
We took an L in this one. Even though this woman, I understand it's an old lady. I get it. I, I'm not going to, I'm not blame her. However, we have to stand up against this. People need to recognize that this is discouraging self-defense. This is discouraging people defending themselves. And it's a huge deal. I think this is something that we're going to have to revisit a number of times, especially with all these other stories that are coming up about all these shootings that have happened in Texas. We've had a number of shootings in Texas. Uh, we Tito had mentioned them in his news report a second ago, but we are definitely going to have to come around and talk about this more in depth sometime this week. There was also the story of a, a vehicle uh, running people over a dozen people in the U.S.-Mexican border over the weekend as well. Uh, a lot of very concerning stories that we will have to get to at another day because I want to get to the story about New York City Catholic Church. Now, this is reported by the Daily Wire, and I think this is interesting that the Daily Wire is reporting this. Because I actually didn't see it in, in a lot of Catholic news sources, though some did, but I saw not saw, did not see it in a lot. A Catholic church in New York City is facing some backlash from its own parishioners over a display titled "God is Trans: A Queer Spiritual Journey." Nothing else needs to be said. At just that alone, I, I you should be infuriated as a Catholic. God is trans. That is a blasphemy. That should infuriate you because blasphemy is one of the greatest sins that you could ever commit. King Louis IX pierced the tongue of a nobleman who would blaspheme the holy name of our Lord. And this New York City priest decided that it was a good idea to set up these things in New York, this blasphemy against God. I, I want this needs to be, there needs to be a great outrage. There needs to be petitions. There need to be protests. There need to be rosary rallies. There needs to be reparation. The bishop needs to come out and condemn this action. It is bad when the world blasphemes God, but it is severely worse when a priest of God in the order of Melchizedek, a priest of God who dedicates his life to the church, when they desecrate and blaspheme the holy name of our Lord, this is something that is intolerable. The story goes on, according to a report published on Sunday by the New York Post, the Church of St. Paul the Apostle, located on Manhattan's west side, is known to be, quote, very liberal. Despite that, for some church members, the God is trans display appears to be a bridge too far, or at least one that is going to require an explanation. One prisoner told the Post the display felt out of place in the church and noted that a priest, when asked by a friend about it, has not given an answer. The church should not be promoting this. I understand that there are transgender people. I pray for all people. But enough is enough, a prisoner said. Now, there's so much more that needs to be said about this that we just don't have time to get to. So we definitely have to revisit this story as well. But the Archdiocese of New York, the Post reached out to the Archdiocese of New York, but a spokesman did not offer any comment beyond stating that he had not been aware that the display existed. How is this not being known? So here's my question. We see over and over again restrictions on traditional Latin mass communities. We see over and over again condemnations against traditional Catholics. We see over and over again all these things. If you try to uh, try to do anything traditional, you're schismatic. You are against the church. If you treat, teach traditional Catholic teaching, then you are against the church of God. You are against the magisterium. But if you have these kind of things, nothing happens to you. Nothing happens to you. And this has to change. Instead, we need to promote good things and condemn bad things. Is that a controversial statement? For some reason, it is. The saying that God is trans, this priest should be defrocked. He should be declared schismatic. And all those who agree with him, all those who support him, should be declared schismatic. Because this is one of the gravest things that we've seen in a very, very long time. And this happened right here in the United States. Every bishop in, in America should be condemning this. Every bishop in America should be calling their brother bishops and saying, hey, why is this allowed? We need to condemn this. This needs to be disallowed across the board. So let's pray and offer reparation against the wounds that, that harm our lady and our Lord. All this and so much more coming up next on Catholic Drive Time. 
Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Your church most likely has a praise and worship time. Would you be surprised to know that the songs you sing might have nothing to do with worship? So here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, history. Praise and worship was not a term used until the mid-60s when the Jesus people music started becoming more complex and contemporary. By the late 70s, praise and worship had become an entire entity of its own. Secondly, what is worship? It's a sacrifice. It's not singing a soft, flowy song with hands raised. The New Testament writers understood that worship was a sacrifice, that it occurred on an altar, which was and is known as a place of slaughter. Thirdly, the altar is for you. Jesus, in the holy sacrifices of the Mass, invites you to participate in His timeless sacrifice of love that truly occurs on the altar. No nightclub effects, no entertainment, no pumped up emotion. Oh, and please don't register for the next Praise and Worship Global Seminar. Why? Because you can't teach praise and it won't include worship. Yikes! I've been listening to Guadalupe Radio for a couple years now, and I think it was a bumper sticker I saw on somebody's car one time, and it's a radio station that I don't have to be concerned about or worried about. When the kids and I are driving, I don't have to worry about inappropriate items. It's just the opposite. It's educational. I've learned so many different topics and on different subjects that I couldn't believe being a Catholic and being baptized as a child. There's so many things I didn't know, and now in these past couple years that I've been listening in, I've learned so much. Welcome back to the Catholic Drive Time Show. Today is Monday, May 8th, in the year of our Lord, 2023, and these are your headlines for this morning. Crux is reporting with a potential lawsuit looming. The federal government has issued a waiver to allow a Catholic hospital in Oklahoma to keep the flame of its long-lit sanctuary candle burning, which in Catholic tradition symbolizes the presence of Christ. Also, CatholicCulture.org and Fides is reporting two Catholic priests who were kidnapped in southern Nigeria on April 30th have been released. Fathers Chochos Kunav and Rav Ogigba were set free on May 4th in good health. Local media reported that their kidnappers had demanded the ransom, although the Nigerian bishops have a policy of refusing to pay ransom. Catholic World Report is reporting a new book by Cardinal Muller has been released in True and False Reform, published by Emmaus Academic. The former prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith states, the devastating consequences of a modernist and a traditionalist reception of Vatican II are these are there for all to see, end quote. And finally, Britain's new monarch, King Charles III and his wife, Queen Camilla, are crowned on Saturday at Westminster Abbey in a religious ceremony rich with ancient traditions and pageantry. Aged 74, Charles is the oldest British monarch ever to be crowned, having ascended to the throne upon the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. These are not my thoughts, these are facts. In 1534, King Henry VIII of England enacted the Act of Supremacy, ultimately turning England from Catholic to Protestant. Because of this, in the 16th and 17th centuries, over a period of 150 years, several hundred men and women from all levels of society and social backgrounds gave their lives for the Catholic faith in order to freely worship in England and Wales. The majority were hanged, drawn, and quartered. A few were beheaded, and some died after a long imprisonment or under torture. Of these, over 300 are recognized by the church as saint or blessed. I am Tito Edwards, and these are today's headlines through a Catholic lens. Thank you, Tito, for keeping us up to date. And uh, people should stay with us because in the next hour, we're going to actually have a longer discussion about the coronation of King Charles in the next hour. It'll be a good conversation to have because there's a lot of uh, dispute. People are going back and forth saying, oh, we should condemn this. And other people are saying, no, this is great. We should celebrate it. And I think... There is a middle way, and I, we're going to discuss that in the next hour. And that is a uh, for for anyone who uh, would get that joke, the the Via Media, it's a joke about the Anglicans. But anyway, uh, joining us right now is uh, Steve Ray. Good morning to you, Steve Ray. Everybody knows Steve Ray, right? Good morning. Glad to be here with you. Praise be to God. And you know the they call you the the Catholic Indiana Jones because you are over in the in the Holy Land all the time. Okay. And you uh, have those awesome outfits that look very much like the, the Indiana Jones. But uh, good morning to you. It's a it's a good conversation to have. I kind of um, jokingly said uh, the that the topic today is going to be uh, 
the case of the mis- disappearing Christians in the Holy Land um, and kind of a little tongue in cheek. But at the same time, this is actually a very sad situation. Uh, so tell me about this situation of what's going on in the Holy Land. Well, first of all, good morning to both of you. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I get to meet Tito for the first time. I've been getting emails and things from him for years and uh, finally get to talk to him and meet him face to face is good, at, you know, through Zoom. But that's uh, that's nice. And uh, also, uh, I got the nickname Jerusalem Jones based on Indiana Jones. So I if love you go it. to JerusalemJones.com, it actually goes to my website. So, <laughs> I love it. We, we've been there, my wife and I, um, to Israel over 200 times. And that doesn't count the times we've been to Iraq and Egypt and Jordan and Syria and other places. But yeah, it's uh, it, it, in, the, in the land where Christianity was born. It's uh, unfortunate that the population of Christians there is less than 1.5 percent. That's uh, that's a small number, mm-hmm. and they're leaving in droves, basically, uh, especially in areas like Bethlehem, because you don't. You, there's 70 percent unemployment in Bethlehem, and you just don't have opportunities for your for your family. So many of the people are are packing up and leaving. Um, Islam is taking over the whole area uh, in the middle in that part of the, uh, you know, that's called the West Bank area of Bethlehem and so on. But in all of Israel as well, the Christians are somewhat second class citizens and they're leaving because they get better opportunities in the West, going to Australia, Canada, United States or somewhere. In fact, up I'm in Michigan and north of us is Flint, Michigan. There are more people from Bethlehem and Nazareth there than there are in Bethlehem and Nazareth, more Christians um, in, in these cities than there are in Nazareth or Bethlehem now. So it's a, it's a sad situation. But one of the things that we do in our pilgrimage is we take seven trips a year there with groups. We always support the Christians. That's what we do. We stay at Christian hotels, Christian restaurants, Christian shops, everything we can. The saddest thing for me is to see Catholic groups going over and working with Muslims. Mm -hmm. It's a, it just seems to me like totally upside down. If you're going to go over there, at least support the living stones. You go to look at the old stones of the church, you know, the ruins of the, of this church and the ruins of that church or all these old stones, but we should really be spending our time and our money supporting the living stones of the church that are still there. No, 100%. I 100% agree. And, you know, I, I talk about this sometimes in regards to our, our own country as well. We have uh, our, you, you see the Mormons and the Mormons support the Mormons. They always help each other out. The Jews support the Jews. If you're a, especially you, you hear that I was uh, visiting my, my friend Angie in, in, in California. She was like, yeah, yeah. If you're, if you're trying to get it in Hollywood, uh, if you're Jewish, they're like, oh, you're Jewish. I'm Jewish. Don't you worry. I'll get it, hook you up with a job. But if you're not, then you better work your butt off because it's going to be a much harder uphill battle. Um, <clears throat> same thing with a lot of Protestant groups, the, the Bethel organization, all these groups. Oh, the Bethel group. They, if you're Bethel, okay, we're going to hook you up. But Catholics don't do that. And it's like, why? No, no. Why do we not do that? We These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And why are we not taking care of one another? And I think that's such an important point to talk about um, the principle of subsidiarity and taking care of people, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. So what how could somebody in America support these people in the Holy Land? Because uh, and other than going on a pilgrimage, which I think is a great opportunity, I did that a few years ago and uh, got to see the Holy Land. And we we did that. We went to. Uh, we went with a Franciscan sister, and we supported all the different Catholic groups across the Holy Land. Uh, but how could somebody in the U.S. support them uh, here? Well, that's a good question. I know how I do it. People send me checks, and I take them and give them directly to the families in Jerusalem and Bethlehem oh, that I know need the money. There's a lot of organizations I don't trust most of them because mm-hmm. I know a lot of the money never gets to the people. There's people going around the United States selling olive wood in parishes and places. Most of, A lot of that is not even authentic stuff, and it doesn't get back to Bethlehem at wow. all. So th- there's a lot of money involved in the uh, in these things donations and so on giving money and you really don't know where it's ending up let's stop right there for a second uh the the olive wood because i've seen this and i didn't know this and now i'm I'm kind of upset um the 
the olive wood, I've seen parishes sell them, and I've myself purchased uh, things from those little shops. The money's not going to the Holy Land? Uh, could tell me about it this. It ends up, no. It's, uh, m most of it ends up in the people's pocket who are selling it. And um, I, I just, I had a lady write to me and send me the name of some people who were s wanting to come into her parish and sell olive wood. And I wrote to the fr my friends in Bethlehem that know. Because, see, when you're a Christian, you, you can tell by your name. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you, you have a Christian name or a Muslim name. And a lot of the people selling of, uh, aren't even Christians. And then second of all, oh I asked about this company and they said, no, that's not, uh, that money never gets back to Bethlehem. It's a, this, some of these people are very wealthy and that they make a lot of money off it and very little of it ever gets back to Bethlehem. Now there are, you can send money to the patriarch, for example, and that ends up, um, that's a good way to send it to Pierre Batista Pizzabella is his name right now. It's uh, Pierre Batista Pizzabella. He's an Italian, and he is the oh. um, patriarch of of Jerusalem. And uh, he, if you send money there, I know it gets there. But I know there's others that I'm not going to mention any names. But uh, Franciscans, even where the money doesn't mm. go where it's supposed to go. There's no, a, I believe that. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Tito. There's an order of Malta uh, hospital, isn't there? Or some sort of health facility in the Holy Land? There's In Bethlehem, it's called the Ho uh, Holy Family Hospital. And there's also, <clears throat> that's supported by the Knights of Malta. And then the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre have the Bethlehem University. And I my problem with those two for example, at Bethlehem University. I'm a Knight of the Holy Sepulchre, so, I mean, it's our organization supports them. But what they don't tell you is that 85% of the students there are Muslims. Oh, and really? so it, it's owned by the LaSalle brothers. They're a very liberal group of Catholic uh, monks, and it's an order. But th they took all the crucifixes down off the walls in the university. It's it, They don't do anything to evangelize the Muslims. And uh, it's... I, I don't mind if people know what they're donating to. They're donating to mm -hmm. a um, a university that is owned and run by some liberal uh, order of brothers, LaSalle brothers. But I think people ought to know that they're sending it to a, a Catholic university, but that more than 85 percent of the students are Muslims graduating from that. And um, when I had a group of folks from the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre. I always have some of them in my groups, but this was a group of all, they were all Knights and Ladies. Well, I'm going to have to hold there. you right there, Steve. Okay. Uh, we're going to have to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to pick up on this because I'm learning a bunch of things that I didn't know right here, and I am uh, kind of upset, to be honest. So we're going to pick up right here where we left off in just one moment. Uh, don't go anywhere. More about the case of the disappearing Christians in the Holy Land right after this. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Your only daughter met a fine young man who was a committed Mormon. She now wants to join his church. What's your answer? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, a reason for no. Doctrinal positions such as the deity of Jesus and the Trinity. Your reason for yes. You deem seemingly moral character as superseding biblical truth. Secondly, orthodoxy. Your answer is probably no. But how and why? Your resistance to Mormon doctrine does not just come straight down from the Bible. It comes from the first five centuries of brilliant theologians, bishops, and popes. These Catholics wrote, debated, and fought for truth. Example, in 250 AD, 311, and 417, three different popes excommunicated three different heretics, Sibelius, Arius, and Pelagius. They denied the Trinity, the eternal deity of Jesus, or taught that human effort warranted salvation. Would your pastor excommunicate a heretic? Well, unfortunately, your pastor can only remove someone from his local congregation. But that's okay. That guy will probably end up being welcomed at a church down the street. Hey, Donnie, what do we say when we make the sign of the cross? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Did Mama teach you that? As parents, we're the primary educators of our Catholic faith to our children. And if you don't know your Catholic faith as well as you should, that's okay. Just tune in daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network by logging online to grnonline.com. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Listen, learn, love, and pass it on. to the Catholic Drive Time Show. This is your host, Adrian Ponseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. It's a wonderful day to be here on Catholic Radio. And remember, we're still in the Easter season, so you're still able to just shout out wherever you are. If you're driving, roll down the window, 
and just yell out at the top of your lungs, Christ is risen, alleluia, alleluia. Praise be to God it is a wonderful thing to do. It's to just let everyone know, everyone in the streets know that the man on the cross has now risen. Praise be to God. Joining us right now Praise. is Jerusalem Jones himself, uh, Mr. Steve Ray. Good morning to you, Mr. Steve Ray. Good morning again. Good to be here. Absolutely. Glad to uh, have you here. Before we went to break, we were discussing the situation in the Holy Land, especially the monetary situation, which is really upsetting me because I'm like, I, I've supported a lot of these things in the past. And like you said, if someone wants to donate to something, you can do it to what you want with your money. However, we should know what we're donating to. And this is a thing that we, a drum that we should be all the time here, actually, when we interview the Lepanto Institute about these Catholic organizations, purported Catholic organizations donating to evil things. Um, so let's pick up where we left off. We were talking about the university there, which I did not know was majority Muslim. I just assumed that it was a Catholic university and you would have mostly Catholics at that university. And weird, weird thought, I know, but to pick, <laughs> let's pick up right there. Well, that's what I, it, it is 85 or plus percent Muslim. And in some ways they get the priority there. Um, and, and one of the things is that the university there, they took down the crucifixes. They don't do anything towards evangelization. And I, when the group that I took there of knights and ladies, I gave them, I wouldn't go in with them and I'm not going to have my picture taken with it because they would use it. Uh, mm. So I dropped them off and I said, we'll pick you up in an hour and a half. And uh, but, <laughs> They, uh, but they, I gave them some questions to ask. What are you doing to evangelize the Muslims here? Oh, well, well, nothing. We're just, uh, you know, here to give them a good education. Now, it does give the Catholic Church a good face because they're helping and they're supporting. But if if people are going to donate, they ought to know that they're donating to an organization that is 85% graduating Muslims. And that's, people should know that. And um, so they wouldn't let our group go out to dinner with the ones who, the Christians, they said, oh no, we, that's not allowed to fraternize with, uh, you, you have to just come for our meeting in our university and we'll present you with the students. But it, it, I don't mind donating if you know what you're donating to. And the same thing with the Holy Family Hospital in Bethlehem is 95% of the babies born there are Muslim babies. So it, it, Muslims have a lot more babies than Christians do over there, by the way. They're, they have uh, 10, 20 kids, some of them. I know a Muslim guy there has got 25 kids because he's got four wives. And that's in Hebron. But there's more Muslim babies being born than Christians by far. And that's one of the reasons the numbers of Christians are going down in the Middle East. But even the Holy Family Hospital is 95% of the births are Muslim babies. And I have no problem again. That's we as Catholics, we do go into areas and we do good for all people. We don't say, oh, because you're a Catholic, we'll take care of you. But you're a Muslim, we're not going to take care of you. But my issue is if you're going to ask Catholics to donate, let them know the truth of what they're donating for so that they are advised in there. And back to the olive wood. Um, a lot of the olive wood now is made in China. It's knockoffs. What? And oh. it, I have an article up on my website that was told about how China is flooding the world with olive wood products, making it look like it comes from the Holy Land. In Holy Land, these are artists. There's there's ones called Twamey, for example. I know him, and he's an artist. He learned sculpturing in Rome and went back, and he did it now with he does it with olive wood. And his olive wood pieces are Janic. Oh no, I packed it already. Sorry, I was going to show you one of them, but um, his olive wood are just beautiful. They they look like they pop out when he makes the eyes. But the, the Christians are not getting the sales that they used to because there's a lot of Chinese knockoffs going around and people are selling them as being from Bethlehem when they're not. Steve, this is Tito. I have a question for you. Uh, what is the life of a Christian uh, on the ground level? What I have an anecdote that I read where <laughs> this, this Christian lady, Catholic, would hang her rosary from her car window every day, and her family's been there since since the since the evangelization since the Pen since Pentecost, and almost without fail every other day she, when she comes comes back to her car parked in her own home, her window is cracked or smashed, and it's becoming too expensive to replace it, and and she realizes it's because of a rosary on there, and that's just an anecdote, and I know well, that's that true. I I I know a lady. 
one of the last Christian families that lives on the Mount of Olives. It used to be, by the way, it used that, to be Middle Exactly, East. Mount of Olives. I re, that's the story where I read that from. Yep. And it, it, the um, whole of the Holy Land was 100% Christian at one time. Now it's 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 not. It's out, Mount of Olives used to be Christian up there. It's a Christian area, but now it's all Muslims. And I, I know a lady who lived there with her family, and this rally took place 10 years ago. Uh, she's a friend. I haven't talked to her for a while now, but she said the same thing, that her kids are terrorized by the Muslims up there, and they don't like the cross or the crucifix, obviously. They view that as uh, idol worship, and they smashed her windshield because of her rosary. When you are, when you see a car driving around with a rosary in the window, it's a very courageous thing, actually, to do. And in the Middle East, you, Jews are very strongly Jews. Muslims are Muslims. Christians are Christians. You, it, it's different than over here. You don't, the Christians there are not converts like me. I'm not a, I'm a convert to Catholicism. I was born Baptist and they don't have over there all the denominations like we do. There's Catholic or Orthodox. Those are the two. They're both the ancient religions, the Greek or the ancient Orthodox, it's Syrian Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, or you have Armenian Orthodox, and you have Catholics. Those are the Christian groups, the ancient ones with the sacraments. And then you have Muslims, and then you have Jews. You are born into whatever religion you are. And what you're born into, you stay. So in many ways, unhappily for the Christians there, I would say they're not like evangelical, I mean that in the sense of carrying a Bible and talking about Jesus all the time. They'll have tattoos. I have a good friend there. Now he's got a big tattoo of Jesus on his arm and a rosary on this arm, and he's very proudly Catholic. But a lot of the people there are Catholic by the fact that they're not a Muslim. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's an ethnic. It's a. It's like you belong to this club. I was born into this club, and that's the club I fight for. And in, in the, unfortunately, you have the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews, and that's that's how okay. it is over there. But, so for a Christian on the ground, you are a very uh, small minority, and there is there is a persecution that we, we always hear about how the Christians are persecuted by the Jews. The Jews are, well, the, the, the Jew, the, Israel is a only country in the Middle East where there's freedom of religion. It's not perfect. But there's churches and there's mosques and there's a freedom of religion. But the Christians still being that small of a minority. Are, so are what still about the situation of uh, evangelization there? Because, I mean, traditionally, like you mentioned a second ago, the Holy Land, I mean, the Holy Land belongs to the church. And that's a, it's always been uh, a Catholic country for 2000 years up until Muslims took over. But even then, it was still a Catholic nation. It was just usurped by the Muslims. And now it's uh, the current situation, like 2% of the Holy Land is Catholic. That's absurd. So what about, is there is there any movement of evangelization of wanting to make the country Catholic again? Not really. I, I don't know of any over there. Um, because even the... Uh, under Netanyahu, the prime minister, when we were there last time, there was huge protests in the streets of Jerusalem and the freeways were blocked. It took us two hours to get from the airport, normally 45 minutes, because the Jews were protesting because Netanyahu and his far right uh, government coalition were going to a whole Supreme Court thing is one issue. But one of the things they wanted to do is make it illegal to talk about Jesus wow. in public. And that you could go to jail uh, or prison if you brought up or evangelized or you talked to anybody about Jesus or were outspoken about it, which means as soon as I get off the plane in Israel, I'm going to jail in that if there, that law was ever enacted. But th there is that movement. Steve, um, the, I, yeah. I'm, I'm curious. I, from what, me reading the news here, the patriarch of Jerusalem seems to go out of his way to defend and the Muslims and, and the people of Palestine, so-called Palestine in Israel, but he never talks about the persecution of the Christians by the Muslims. Why, why is, I know he's, I, I think he's scared, but what is your perspective? Well, there is a political aspect to it because, see, you, there's no such thing as a Palestinian. Correct. You are either a Christian Palestinian or a Muslim Palestinian. There's no neutral Palestinian. And when you are a Palestinian Christian, you are in the big minority, a small minority, I should say. And you have to be careful what you say. And I, I mean, even when we're with our, our Palestinian Christian guides and so on, I'll say something and they'll go, 
careful, careful what you say, you know, there's people listening. And so there is a, a the, the patriarch does talk about um, the persecution of the Christians, but you are correct. It's mainly and normally referring to Israel as the one that is upsetting and persecuting and holding the Christians down. But you you got to be careful what you say about the Palestinian Muslims because they're your own blood and you can't, you've got to be careful because you, you, you see that Muslims, are, one of the words on the top of their vocabulary list is retaliation. And you do this to us and we're going to get you back. See, because wow. Christians don't do that. We say to love your enemies, forgive and forget. If someone is, uh, sins against you, you forgive them and, and you forget it and you go on. It's not the same in Islam. Yeah. Islam is, the word is retaliation. And if you do this to us, we're coming right back and we're going to do 10 times worse to you. Yeah, that's that's not good. And, you know, it's interesting because I was listening to the, the Daily Wire had that thing they just put out with the, going to the Holy Land. And it was very interesting because you can definitely see the difference between Jewish philosophy, theology, and Catholic philosophy and theology in that conversation, because uh, there was no, there was no giving, getting rid of the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, uh, because they still hold to the Torah and not to uh, our Lord's uh, per call to perfection. So it's very interesting to see the, those kind of conversations happening. Uh, but unfortunately, we're just about out of time. So last thing, Steve, where can people get in touch with you, and where can people learn more about all these things we're talking about? My website is catholicconvert.com. I've got hundreds of documents and letters and things I've written and done that people can download for free. I have a blog that I put things up on every day. I think of interest to Catholics and uh, I make movies. When we go over to the Middle East, I make movies. I put them all up on my website as well. Um, we've got a trip going to Poland in August. We still have a few seats open and I've got four more trips going to Israel this year. I just had both my knees done, so I'm off for a few weeks recovering from that. But uh, we still have four trips to Israel, and two of them are already sold out. But CatholicConvert.com, everything's on there. And uh, There you go, I know CatholicConvert.com. Tito puts com. some of my stuff up on the big pulpit the once in a while. There you Paul go. Tito, by the way. CatholicConvert.com, CatholicConvert.com. Go there to find out more information. Thank you, Mr. Jerusalem Jones, for being on with us. God bless you. God love you. Stay with us in the next hour. We have our Fear and Trembling game show. Plus, we're going to talk about the coronation of the King of England. All this and more coming up on Happy Drive Time right after this. Ever feel like life is just too busy, too much? Constant noise, social and traffic, work, pain, bills. It just doesn't seem to let up. Well, maybe it's time for a change. God offers us relief and hope hope. So if you're feeling like you need more peace and less chaos, then find your hope today. Begin at CatholicsComeHome.com. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Do you really believe in a secret catching away of the church called the rapture? The pages of your Bible are empty of that type of talk. So here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, solid biblical doctrine is time-tested. This rapture idea got its wheels rolling by John Darby in about 1830. I mean, have you heard of a third coming? You know you haven't. Secondly, God's nature. There's no reasonable premise in Scripture, let alone in moral reasoning, for the results of a rapture scenario such as this. A Christian pilot is yanked, raptured, out of his jet, while scores of the remaining passengers who are not Christians violently crash to their death. Meanwhile, said pilot is basking in the presence of God. This is absurd, and believe me, this is preached day in and day out. Thirdly, bad fruit. The preacher at your church says, tonight, don't you be left in that pew alone while that person next to you gets raptured straight up into heaven. That, my friend, is folly with no foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're currently cruising at 39,000 feet. We'll turn that seatbelt sign off for you and let you move about the cabin. Looks like we're about two hours and ten minutes from landing. Plenty of time for you to meditate on Christ's passion. Wouldn't it be great if everyone meditated daily on our Lord's passion? Why not start today? A friendly suggestion from Guadalupe Radio Network. Your 24-hour-a-day source of Catholic inspiration. This is the Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. And 
Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. This is your host, Adrian Fonseca. It's so good to be on with you today. Praise be to God. I'd say a prayer for uh, those persecuted Christians in the Holy Land. It's crazy. We All we ever talk about are uh, the, the Jews being persecuted, the Muslims being persecuted, and all these things. But our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted in the Holy Land, no, nobody cares. Nobody cares. So let's pray for them and... And let's uh, find ways to support them. If we can't figure out a financial way to support them, then at the very least, let's make sure that we're praying for them and keep them in our daily prayers. I know that's going to be part of my prayers from now on. I, it's just so sad. It just, it just makes me upset. But, you know, we were talking about the monarchy. It's very interesting to me because, you know, we have a, a huge, hotly debated topic right now um, in the Catholic world. A lot of the, a lot of people are like, oh, monarchy is not good. We don't want monarchy, yada, yada, yada. And there are some people who are saying, oh, okay, we like monarchy, but not the English monarchy. English monarchy, bad. And other people will say, okay, well, this is actually a good thing. We support monarchy. Therefore, we should support the English crown. And I think that there needs to be a, a middle way. And so my, my perspective is this. The monarchy in England is obviously a usurpation of the Catholic line. In fact, it's very explicitly that is the case. There is a, the Catholic line to the throne and the Protestant line to the throne, or the Anglican line to the throne. And the Anglican line of the throne has now condemned the Catholic line and said that you cannot be Catholic and be the king of England or be royalty even at all. And so there recently was a story, and I say recently, it was about a decade ago, maybe two decades ago, actually. It was a while ago, during the reign of Benedict. There was a a noble woman who married a Catholic man, and she converted to the Catholic faith, and she had to renounce her lying to the throne in order to become Catholic. This is uh, very concerning. So now we see this happen, and it's funny because the title that King Charles has usurped I say usurped because the title was rightly given to the crown, the English crown, but then it was uh, perverted by King Henry VIII, was defender of the faith. And he was given that title because of his attacks against Martin Luther in defense of the seven sacraments, which most uh, scholars believe was actually written by St. Thomas More. So this uh, title, defender of the faith, was given to King Henry VIII by the Holy Father, And later, when Henry VIII abandoned the faith, created his own religion, usurped the authority of the Holy Father, he retained the title Defender of the Faith. Now, King Charles perverts this perversion even further by taking the title Defender of the Faiths with an S, adding an S to that. Now, this was interesting because he had this giant ecumenia in his uh, kingdom, (laughs) where he actually had the, so he received a blessing from a Jewish rabbi, which how does that make sense? Who, who, what Christian gets blessed by Jewish rabbis that doesn't, that doesn't track. And he actually had his oils consecrated by a Greek or by an Orthodox uh, bishop, which is interesting because that um, actually makes the, him the first King to ever be consecrated with actually consecrated oils. Because all of his bishops, the, the king's bishops, are not real bishops. But the Orthodox are real bishops. And so the oils are actually real consecrated oils. So that's the first time it's ever happened in like 1500 years or 500 years. Uh, very, very interesting. So here are the good things and the bad things. Here's, the, here's my take. My take is this. We can recognize the bad in the English monarchy. We can condemn the bad in the English monarchy. We can know and talk about the usurpation of the crown uh, in England. At the same time, we can also give admiration to the sublimity of the, of the office of the king and the ceremonies that surround it. And I actually am glad that the English crown exists because right now, there is no reigning monarch anywhere in the world. There is no place in the world that retains all the pomp and circumstance around the, around the monarchy. So 
the reason why I think this is important is because I think that when there will be a time where monarchy returns to the world, we were talking to Edward Habsburg, the Habsburg Empire. There was Habsburgs all over the world who retained the throne. And in Brazil, they just passed a law recently saying that a monarchy is a legitimate form of government. Before, there was no option of monarchy in Brazil. Now it's at least on the books as possible. There is a huge movement in Spain to push for the return of the monarchy. And the king of England, or the king of Spain over there, is, is still uh, retains his titles. And he goes around, and I've heard that he is uh, way, far more loved than the prime minister there. <laughs> this is the case all over the world. We're seeing this kind of resurgence of monarchy. However, th there is a lack of memory of monarchy. And there is a lot of places like America who never had a monarchy. So in the U.S., we never had a, a monarch in the United States. And so we don't have the pomp and circumstance around the monarchy. We don't know. We don't have a memory of the monarchy. And even a lot of these uh, places that have had monarchy for thousands of years do not have a memory of the monarchy anymore because it's been destroyed by World War I and II. And so having the King of England exist and being able to see the ceremony, even if it's perverted with ecumenia, we still can see the way it should go, the way a monarchy should run, at least from the, the ceremonial aspects of it. And because of that, I think it's good. Because we need an example. We need something to see and say, okay, there is a basis for when the monarchy returns. There's a basis of, of what something should look like. And another comment was made by a Dominican priest in England who was commenting on the, on the circumstance that happened, how the king of England, he gets crowned and then he gets anointed and all these things happen behind a screen. Behind, yeah, it's not you. seen by the people. And they made the point that this is a, that the sacred, that the coronation is a, is a sacred function. It's something that happens that is supposed to be sacred. Now, obviously the, we just talked about the usurpation of the King and you know, all these other things. We're going to put that aside for a second. The, a coronation of a King is in fact a sacred ceremony. It is in fact something beautiful and something wonderful. And yet it is hidden. Why is it hidden? Because there's an element of mystery about it where the people are gathered and they're looking at it happen, but they can't see the actual action taking place. Once it is finished, he is unveiled and you see the king standing there. Now, another priest was making a comment about this, and I'm forgetting the name of the priest. I should have written it down. Another priest was making a comment about this saying, we can see this as an analogy of the liturgical world. We can see this as an analogy of the liturgical world in the sense that those things that are most mysterious, that are most sacred, should be veiled, should be covered, should be hidden. And we see that in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, because the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass should be done ad orientum, that is facing the east, that is facing towards the tabernacle, should, uh, facing away from the people. This is uh, opposed to the, the Holy Mass done ad populum toward the people, which destroys the sense of the mystery, destroys the sense of the sacred. And this is something that has caused us to have a familiarity with the mysteries that breeds contempt. I mean, there's a reason why there's a saying, familiarity breeds contempt. Because you do something enough times and you get kind of bored with it, no matter how amazing it is. You are a, someone who has this amazing job and people are like, wow, that's such a cool job. And you're like, eh, it's just a nine to five for me. Why is that the case? Because familiarity breeds contempt. This is why priests also, uh, according to canon law, are not allowed to say mass more than once or twice a day. In fact, really, it should only be once a day, but because of a lot of the situation of lack of priests, priests are given the permission to do it more than once a day. And then on Sundays, they're allowed to do it many times. I think it's three to four times a day. And this is a abuse. This is a required because of the circumstance of not enough priests, but it's an abuse because it is something that could be damaging to the life of the priest because familiarity breeds contempt. So the third mass, the father saying for the day, he's like, Oh great. I got to go in and say another mass. And you're like, no, that's so bad because now he's having this, this disposition of the mass of like, it's a burden and not a blessing, not a grace. And this is happens for the laity as well. 
when there is a sense of the mystery, when you're like trying to peek over the screen and say, oh, what is Father doing? Look, he's whispering. He's, he's doing the words of consecration. There's a sense of mystery that occurs at that moment that is beautiful, that is wonderful. And that's lost in ad populum toward the people celebrations. This is why these things are, are, are veiled. This is why we use a sacred language, because it preserves the sense of the mystery. It preserves a sense of the sacred. It encourages us to try to learn more. It encourages us to try to look over. You know how you see uh, construction workers, or maybe this is a guy thing, I don't know. But you see these construction on these houses, things like that, and you're trying to peek through, and they, they have these little flaps on the, on, the, uh, on the chain link fence, and you try to peek through, see them doing the construction, because a hiddenness breeds curiosity. And a holy curiosity is good. A wonder, a wonder and awe is good. And so we see the sacred mysteries. We hear the words in Latin language and we say, I want to know more. I, I want to dive deep into this. You peek through the curtain and you try to see what is happening on the other side. You want to know and to know is to love. So you desire to know more about the Holy Mass. You desire to know more about the sacred mysteries and you come to love the Holy Mass. You come to love the sacred mysteries. That's what happens to us. And this is a great lesson that we can learn from this coronation. And so I think this is something that we should discuss further. And maybe in the after show, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the situation with the uh, A Case for American Monarchy. Uh, Crisis Magazine put out two articles uh, one, a case against American monarchy and a case for the American monarchy. This might be an interesting conversation to have, kind of a more fun conversation than anything. However, at the end of the day, when America has a monarchy, we all know that in reality it'll be me, right? Right, Tito? I completely agree. <laughs> I, I, I was uh, telling my friend this. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I, don't worry, guys. When I become king, everything will work out. And they were like, no, you're daydreaming. And I'm like, don't worry, don't worry. It'll be, it'll be great. It'll be great. At least it'll be better than our, our current system. I think most people will agree with at least that much. But praise be to God. I think it's an interesting thing. So what are, what are, you go to the personal ordinary of the chair of St. Peter. Do they, uh, what was the kind of milieu among them? Because they're more, they have the more Anglican traditions. Uh, what is the, what was their kind of feeling about the situation? That's a good question. I just met with some of them, had dinner, uh, lunch with them, celebrating the uh, confirmation and uh, first communion of their son. And uh, it, <laughs> I, I think they have contempt for the Protestant monarchy and just want it scrapped and turned into republic. Uh, and I tried to make the case for a Catholic monarchy and they... They were not uh, interested in that. I, I think uh, they're very well catechized. They're, they're, they're very, very well culturized, but they come from the viewpoint that it's, it's, not, uh, it's not worth having a Catholic monarchy over in England. And so I take that as the same thing here in the States. But, uh, you know, history cycles and we are, we, monarchies are going to be coming back because we can see the disorder. And, and when, I, when I mean disorder, I don't just mean people are just uh, twisted in their vices and virtues. There's violence on the streets. As, as you can see what happened in New York City and North Dallas and all over the cross the country. So, yeah, th- th- there's a negative view so far. Yeah, that's, uh, that's sad. That's sad to hear. I, I think I agree. there needs to be a, a love for the monarchy. I've seen this more and more. We talked about this with uh, Edward Habsburg. The, there's a weird trend in America that um, has this admiration uh, of monarchy. Now, it's not, it's not incredibly prevalent, but it's more prevalent than you would have thought in this place like America, which teaches a contempt for monarchy in our schools. So... I don't know, maybe we'll discuss more during the after show. Because right now we have our Fear and Trembling Game Show. You can call in and be our contestant. The number to call, 877-757-9424. 877-757-9424. That's the number to call to be part of our game show, Fear and Trembling. We take the first caller, and you could be the first caller. Dial 877-757-9424. We'll be right back with more right after this. I've never-
never heard y'all before. There is this lady with her big white SUV, and on the back of the windshield is this big cross with y'all's radio station underneath. Put it on y'all's radio station anyhow, and then it starts talking about the saints and how the saints give you signs, and they lead you into the right direction. I just appreciate you and God for putting that sign in my life and letting me know that it, it is him, and it's okay. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Radio for your soul. Hello, this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. What's your go-to for interpreting the Bible? You go on Sinatra, he did it his way, or you go on Magisterium, we're doing it the Apostles' way. Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. The Magisterium. What's that? That's the indisputable 2,000-year teaching authority of the Church. The Catechism says, the task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the Catholic Church alone. Secondly, a stark contrast. Again, the Catechism says, the Magisterium is not not superior to the Word of God, but it is its servant. In contrast, the megachurch pastors are coming up with some crazy stuff. They tell us, quote, God is doing a new thing, or the Lord spoke to me this. Humorously, out from all of this, they become their own pseudo-magisterium. And thirdly, Mr. Sinatra, your voice and your music in the 40s swooned my mother, but with lofty lyrics and a lot of ego, your advice from the 1975 hit, I did it my way, falls short. Come on, let's get under the comforting shade of the magisterium. Hey, Donnie, what does the catechism say that the purpose of life is? To know, love, and serve God to be happy in the next. That's right, so we can be happy with Him in the next life. As parents, we're the primary educators of our Catholic faith to our children, and if you don't know your Catholic faith as well as you should, that's okay. Just tune in daily to the Guadalupe Radio Network by logging online to grnonline.com. The Guadalupe Radio Network. Listen, learn, love, and pass it on. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. <laughs> the Catholic trivia game show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. Eight seven 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 five seven nine four two four. That's the number to call to be part of our game show, Fear and Trembling, where we give out prizes and you could win. Now, you might be asking, what am I listening to? What's going on here? I want to know because uh, I have never, I never called in. I never heard this before. Well, don't you worry. The, I'll explain it to you. We're having our Fear and Trembling game show where we have three Catholic trivia questions. And the trick is I'm not going to ask you the questions. Instead, I'm going to ask Tito the questions. You're going to have 15 seconds on the clock to determine who is right, uh, whether or not he's trying to trick you or whether or not he is telling you the truth, which means that every question is a 50-50 chance to win the prize. And the, it's a very, very simple game. And every right answer goes into our coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. Tito, what could they win? Thank you, Adrian. The fear and trembling prize for this week from Catholic Answers is Father Sebastian Walsh's Heart of the Gospel. In Heart of the Gospel, Father Walsh demonstrates compellingly how these eight declarations from the Sermon on the Mount, known as the Beatitudes, make up the foundation, essence, and final goal of Jesus' teaching. They are as central to the gospel as the Ten Commandments were to the old law, a roadmap for navigating the new covenant. Available now from Catholic Answers. Thank you very much uh, from Catholic Answers. I know Fa Father Sebastian Walsh. I actually got to uh, meet Father Sebastian when I went to California. That was really cool. Nice. I was, yeah, I was like, man, that's uh, he was a he's, he's such a nice guy. He was he's just as nice as he is in uh, in person. He's also surprisingly taller than I was expecting. Not gonna <laughs> lie, I was uh, kind of surprised by that. But uh, yeah, the Norbertines, man, they rock. They 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 rock. Uh, they're pretty great. It's an understatement. Uh, I know it. I know it. Uh, but joining us right now is Rhonda. Good morning to you, Rhonda. Yes, good morning, Adrian. It's good, good to hear your voice Back again. Good morning, guys. Yes, good morning, guys. Good morning, everyone listening. <laughs> amen, amen. Rhonda, you're at, uh, yes. remind me again, St. Francis Cabrini, is that the parish? Yes, sir, St. Francis Cabrini. Amen, amen. Praise be to God. It's good to hear your voice. Have you been to California? Uh, no, I, I have never been. Well, I got to say, there's a, there's a lot to dislike about California. However, 
There's also a lot to love about California. First, I mean, their weather, I've heard, is great. Whenever I went, it was horrible. But the Norver teams over there are super, super great. So if you ever get a chance, Orange County and the Norbert team, uh, Abbey over there, St. Michael's Abbey. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. But uh, thank you for calling, Rhonda. And you're familiar with the game, but you're not. You've never called in when uh, Tito was here. So are you no, are you familiar with Tito? Are, do you, are you are you going to? Um, what do you think about? You know what? It's it's well. You know, it's funny you mentioned that because I remember uh, Joe. Hello. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. Sorry. Because <laughs> I re- I remember uh, uh, Joe McLean used to used to try to get me to commit as to who was trickiest whenever it you know the questions were being asked to two of you. Uh huh. And I never re- would really commit. However, I would have to say I think from listening, uh, Tito has you beat <laughs> as far as being tricky. Aww. Well, there you go, folks. There you go. Tito is officially the trickiest uh, on the <laughs> on the uh, Fear and Trembling game show. It's been confirmed. It's uh, it is indisputed. <laughs> Rhonda has spoken, and now we know it. Is, she has spoken ex cathedra, so now ex- we know. <laughs> Now we know. Now, actually, and, and actually, I mean, I'm not going to say never, but I was going to say as far as California, I mean, it's, uh, I believe what you're saying, but actually my husband and I, mine and my husband's favorite vacation spot is, is San Antonio. Ah, nice. Nice. Praise be to God. That's where me and my family went every year growing up. We went to San Antonio every single spring break when we were kids, but uh, praise oh, be to God. So we, we love San Antonio. It's like I told my confessor, it's like in San Antonio and just a, to me, just around the river walk, which I think is so beautiful. There's like a, there's a, there's a Catholic church around every corner. We love it. We love it. We love the missions as well. Uh, but let's play yeah. the game, Rhonda. You're familiar with how the mm-hmm. game works. Uh, so I'm sure that you're going to, uh, it's, you're going to nail this out of the park. Right? That was not a, the correct analogy. You're going to knock this out of the park. There we go. I can speak. Oh, I'm, uh, I'm easily fooled. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't you worry, Rhonda. Don't you worry. We, it's going to be great. Let's begin. Uh, Tito. The question goes to you. Yeah. The question on the board. (laughs) Approximately how many people officially, keyword officially, Officially. reside in the Vatican? Reside as in live there officially as in officially reside. Vatican, a micro state, one of the smallest micro states in the world. Maybe San Marino might be even smaller, but... I, I don't know. I, I, I'm just going to grab a number from the New Testament and say 70, like the 70 d- uh, disciples that they chose to evangelize when Jesus, when they uh, picked who to go throughout Israel. You know, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, the, the Pope was probably like, you know, we, we want 70 to, yeah. to have a biblical, only 70 citizens. No one else gets to be a citizen. That makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, it's small. So oh, yeah, how, it's, it's pretty tiny. tiny. Yeah. It's pretty tiny. All righty, Rhonda, 15 seconds on the clock. The question on the board is approximately how many people officially reside in the Vatican? Tito seems to think it's 70. What say you, Rhonda? Oh, goodness. I have no clue. This is an absolute guess. Um, uh, false. She's going to go with false. Way to go, oh, Rhonda. Praise me to God. Yes, you Ronda. nailed it. You nailed it. Easy peasy. Easy, yeah. She knew that it. That was an absolute guess. No. <laughs> you knew. You knew. She's hustling us. She's yes, hustling she us. Uh, it's okay. They know, and the correct answer is, in fact, 700. There are 700 oh, people okay. that officially reside in the Vatican. The Vatican is tiny, itty bitty, and most of the land is populated by churches <laughs> so officially like 700 that. people believable. <laughs> there you go there you go all righty Rhonda, you're in for one right now you have a 100 percent success rate are you ready for question number two okay oh, i'm um, sure let's sure. do it let's do it tito the question on the board what is the scholarly study of the belief and doctrines of christianity called Belief in the doctrines, so believing in the doctrines, that would be this, God is ultimately the, the study of these doctrines. So theos from Greek, I'd say theology. 
You're going to say theology. Yes. Okay. Theology. Yes, theology. I, was, I mean, if it was me, I would, I would have went with beliefology. But uh, that sounds but, even better. But all right, we'll go with theology. I'm going with theology. Oh, all right. If you say so. <laughs> uh, all righty, Rhonda. <laughs> 15 seconds on the clock. The question on the board is, what is the scholarly study of the belief and doctrines of Christianity called? Tito says it's not beliefology, uh, but instead it's actually theology. Uh, 15 seconds on the clock. Rhonda, what say you? Is he right or is he wrong? I'm going to say that would, I would think that would be true. She's going to go with true. Praise be to God. You <laughs> nailed it, Rhonda. Two for two. A 100% success rate. Could not fool you. Uh, I think I think if you had gone with beliefology, I, I think she might have gone with it. I, th I think yeah. that would have tricked her. I think that would have tricked her. But I think it's just the Holy, the, the, the Trinity and and just just all, all of heaven, just all of heaven, including like the Lord our God and sweet Jesus and our blessed mother, just Holy Spirit, everyone with me. There you go. There you go. There, the entire heavenly court is on your yeah. side, Rhonda. So are you ready for question number three? Sure. Then let's do it. Uh, Tito, question number three. Are you ready? I think I'm ready. All right. This is, I uh, got to say, this might be the trickiest question we've ever had on the oh, history man. of Catholic Drive Time. It might be. I don't know. It just might be. Oh, okay. All right. The question on the board is, are religious brothers ordained? Religious brothers? Yes. Not fathers or priests, but brothers? Brothers. I mean, if, if, if priests are ordained and only they can be ordained and religious priests as well, but brothers, I've never heard of brothers being ordained. Um, so you're going with no. You're going with no. I, I, All righty, yeah. Rhonda. The question on the board is, are religious brothers ordained? 15 seconds on the clock. Tito says, no, I don't think so. Uh, what say you, Rhonda? Is he right uh, or is he wrong? What say you, Rhonda, from St. Francis Cabrini uh, in Houston? Yeah, uh... I think this is something I'm going to probably fall for. Uh, I have to say they, I'm going to go with they are ordained. They are ordained. You're going to go with, are you sure you want to go with they are oh, ordained? Uh, okay, they are not. She says they are not. Way to go, Rhonda! <laughs> wow. You nailed it. Easy peasy. See, she knew she, she was trying to along. she was trying to trick us. That's yeah. what it was. That's what it was. Way to go, Rhonda. You rock. Oh, That's good. three for three. You got a 100 percent success rate. I'm sending in the report card right now. Uh, you okay. nailed it. Uh, but praise be to God, Rhonda, you rock. Um, and it's a little bit of a misleading question, to be honest, because yeah. religious brothers can be ordained, but not all religious brothers oh. are ordained. So if you're part of a religious oh, okay. community, all religious, they're they're all brothers, but not all of them are priests. So there you go. What about the what about the women being sisters? So the religious are sisters, they... none of them can be ordained. None of them can be ordained. Oh, no, all okay. religious sisters are not ordained. They're just uh, not just, but they take the the perfect vows of it's poverty, perfect. chastity, oh, okay. and obedience. But thank you, Rhonda, for being on with us. Let me put oh, you on hold. You. God bless you and God love you. Stay on the line so we can get your contact information. God love you. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And that's going to do it for the radio side of our show. If you want to join us for the after show, we're going to discuss all sorts of things during the after show. So much. I'm sure monarchy is going to come up. But whatever it is you want to talk about, we're going to talk about. So join us in the after show. You can go to YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, Odyssey. But if not, we'll see you back tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. Central, 7 Eastern, across the Guadalupe Radio Network. And remember, Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. And we're back. Good morning to you. 
Welcome to the Catholic Drive Time Show. It's a pleasure to be here with you. All sorts of things going on. A very lively chat today. Let's see. Light Z10 says females in college are all over that coronation. Yeah, that's super cringe. That are super cringe. Um, yeah, the uh, women cannot be ordained. It's literally impossible. It's literally impossible. So there you go. Uh, let's see. White Wolf says, I always speak ex cathedra. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Literally everything I say is infallible. Uh, no one should question it. Uh, Patty says, I included you in an Ave Mary. That was the answer. Uh, what was the answer? Um, to which question? To which question? Uh, let's see. Mary says, "World WW, not a tweeter relationship issue. Man, I got to get some context in all these questions. Uh, Teresa said, I get exasperated at the subject of late, like hope and holy family reign and the demonic hype and the demons always speak truth. Um, Teresa, I need a little bit more context. I'm sorry. Trying to find uh, a lot of this context. Uh, people need to re-say things that y'all said before because I'm trying to catch up with all these different things. Uh, very grateful for all the all the topics, though. Uh, Kylie Star 64 uh, says Daily Wire is based. Eh, I don't know. I think some of the things that they say is good and some of the things they say is bad. For instance, their their whole program about the Holy Land, not based at all. Very, very bad. I thought, I was like, this is just uh, just not good. Just not good, in my opinion. Uh, let's see. White Wolf says, what I meant by speaking as cathedra is that I'm always sitting down, not that I am infallible. <laughs> Very good. Very good, White Wolf. That's good. I uh, love to see it. And where were you yesterday? Uh, not yesterday. Friday, White Wolf, on the uh, on the rundown. I didn't see you. You didn't come in to like the, the very, very end. Uh, let's see. Um, a lot of good comments. I'm trying to find one of the things that we wanted to discuss. Kim Sunderman said, when we went there, the Holy Land, we were actually four quarters, the Jewish, Muslim, Armenian, and Christian quarters. That is when we were able to walk the ramparts in Jerusalem. Cannot believe it was 25 years ago. Yeah, that's still the case today. I, that's what I saw, at least, anyways, when I was there. You uh, you went there? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, that's right. That's, you mentioned that earlier in the show. Yeah. Terrific. Did you go on a tour, or you went on your own with some friends or family? No, I went on a pilgrimage. Or, I guess, technically, it a was uh, for I mean. a class. Very fun. It was for, um, I, I took a class on uh, the Holy Land, and at the end of our class, we took a trip to the Holy Land for, I think, was it eight days, ten days? Oh, that was with that. Uh, Oost? Yeah, I was with St. Thomas. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, man. Huh? Yeah. I'm going to so, yawn, try not to yawn into the mic. Uh, Alan says, good morning, Light Z10. Good morning, Alan. What? Adrian, I'll be your tour guide in Rome when you go there. <laughs> Hey, oh. you're gonna come with me, Alan. You can come with me. I'd be happy to be there. Yeah. Have you made it public about your your desires for to Rome? Uh, I have to put it on Twitter. So, oh, okay. Yeah, so yes. Public. Yeah. Have you what What has been the response? What has been people suggesting you? Um. The let's see. Let me go back. Check my Twitter. I haven't checked. A uh, Adrian, I, I'm off Twitter on the week. I I try to stay off of social media on the weekends. Smart. So I'm not on social media at all on the weekends. So I I don't I will post things on Friday. And then check back on Monday. Ah. But let's see. Uh, my friend Emily Esterman says, take Emily, my sister. <laughs> oh. She's talking about my sister. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that, that's a good idea, actually. My sister would love um, Israel. I mean, not Israel. The Holy... I mean, in, uh, Rome. There you go. Italy. All the art. Italy. Oh, that's right. Oh, goodness gracious. Definitely take your sister. Uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall says, I should get, take a pilgrimage. Uh... James, the Catholic, he's actually a, a friend of mine. Uh, he says, I should go on my own and go on a pilgrimage and go with some friends. So I should do all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some guy named Michael H. says, force me to go with you at your expense. I will take that into consideration. Um, I have considered it. I have decided against it. Uh, Irish Hound says, I think sometimes Lexa going alone, you learn more things and it's a better and more thoughtful experience. Yeah, the only problem with going alone, though, is, like, I have no idea what I'm doing. 
<laughs> like I have no clue. I'd just be wandering around. Go go with your sister or go go with a friend. You, it'll be more fun, more more uh, more learning. It, it'll be it'll be a ton of fun. Oh, yeah. when you experience it with somebody else. I, I I don't know if we mentioned this on Friday, but uh, we broke ten thousand subscribers for oh, YouTube. Yeah. Thank you all. Now let's go for a hundred thousand. <laughs> That's a huge jump. How about so, let's try twenty thousand first? So that the quiet ninety thousand out there. Now is your moment now in time. Moment. Grab it, strangle it, press it, create 89,000 other YouTube identities and do it. We believe in you guys. 90,000. I don't <laughs> think you even have 90,000 people who watch. Uh, Sonia says, prayers for the people of Allen in Bronzeville, Texas. Yeah, for yeah. sure. We're going to probably spend uh, a lot of time talking about that tomorrow. It, there's just so much. There's just so, it's horrible. Yeah, it's not a good situation, and it's heartbreaking, really. Uh, Adrian, what what was what are your ideas for monarchy in the United States? Would it be ceremonial, or would it be actual uh, with actual authority to confirm and and approve of and consider parliamentary or congressional legislation, or would it be a complete authoritarian, absolute monarchy, as in the uh, the great King Hen? King Louis the Eighteenth or Fourteenth of France, the Sun the Sun King. What would mm. be your moniker? What, what what would you call this? Would you call yourself the Dominican King? Uh, probably none of the above. Um, it would just it would be a a traditional Catholic monarchy. Okay, uh, like that of uh, medieval times, not yeah. of uh, postmodern or modern times, um, or pre-modern times even. Uh, the idea of an absolute monarchy is pretty, it's a very Protestant idea. Ah. The uh, monarchs were never absolute. And we kind of got into this topic with Edward Habsburg too. You should check out that interview. People should check that out. It was a, if you missed that interview, it was a great, great topic. Um, here's the book. Um, oh, I didn't realize Michael Knowles did a, a blurb for it. The Habsburg Way might be the single most important history book to appear in our troubled times. Huh, interesting. Yeah. The, anyway, so in the book, um, Alan says, "Go to, gotta go, everyone. I have a good priest coming over this afternoon to give us Easter house blessing. Have a great day. Well, God bless you, Alan. Have a great day. The principle of subsidiarity. Uh, his his chapter number three is believe in the empire and in subsidiarity. And I think this is a a great lesson for about kingdoms because kingdoms they were not there was not this absolute monarchy where the king would come in." and just ruled over everyone. He had lords in place throughout his kingdom who made laws locally. And the Lord typically was someone from that area. It wasn't always the case. Sometimes they would put lords in that were from other places, but they lived in that country. They were involved in those countries and those, and those smaller countries were in fact smaller. So you would actually get to know them. So like, for instance, you would have a Lord over Maryland and then you'd have the emperor of United States. And you have the lower levels treating uh, the people at the lower levels first. So the Lord of Maryland would be the first person you'd go to and uh, would take care of you. And those are the people who would be uh, called to uh, call, go to the king on your behalf when things would happen. Ultimately, the king has the final say, but a good king does not lord over his, his, uh, his kingdom in a, in a dictatorial way but instead allows the, the lower levels to govern themselves and only intervenes when necessary. It also wasn't the case that they kind of were able to, to take over as easy as it sounds because the kings typically did not have their own armies. They relied on the lords to raise armies for them and to keep armies for them. And then they would have to persuade the lords to l lend them their army in order to go to war. So it I kind of like how in America we allegedly require Congress to declare war allegedly. before we are able to actually go to war. Now, this practically does not happen. Why? Because the president of the United States is the commander in chief of the U.S. Army. So they kind of just tell the army to do things. They do it. Whereas in a kingdom, the king is not actually doesn't actually have the army himself. And so if the lords of the lower levels were told, tell their army, no, we're not going to, we're not sending you over to the king. Well, that would be a huge, uh, 
loss for the king. He would be, they'd have to persuade the lords. Now, obviously the, the knights and the, the soldiers would have to make decisions on whether or not they're going to obey the Lord or the king. Um, but this is the kind of the principle, a kind of a, the same kind of resistance that we see in Holy Scripture, uh, resist you to the face, uh, Paul to Peter, and so too in the kingdoms. The lords would resist the king to his face if the uh, kings were bad. So this is something that it's kind of seen. So absolute monarchy is just not, it's not Catholic and it's not uh, something that happened. So I think that's uh, important important to talk about. As, as your first act of foreign policy, I think you should allow, allow entry into the Kingdom of America, uh, Canada, and Greenland. Yeah, I mean, I would, I'd be fine with that. Yeah, I think that'd, I'd be, be a great so, idea. I'd be so for that. Yeah. Uh, Edward Habsburg retweeted um, my the interview we did. He said, the interview with Adrian Fonseca about the Habsburg Way was one of the best, even if you can only hear me. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you to... Edward Hasberg for that ringing endorsement. I appreciate it. Let's That's see. awesome. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Habsburg is a practicing Catholic. So is he a special apostate to the Holy See? I need to catch up. Um, there you go. I don't know. He's, I don't know what that has to do with it, what that means. He's the uh, official ambassador from Hungary to the Vatican, right? Yeah. Okay. That's correct. So that means he speaks Hungarian, which is not an easy language to learn. He's oh, is that what they speak there? Yeah. So for some reason, I thought they spoke Austrian. <laughs> huh? In Hungary? Yeah. <laughs> no, don't tell them that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they get all fired up. Well, there you go. <laughs> Let's see. And, and if you tell the Austrians they speak Austrian, they're going to get fired up too. Really? <laughs> they speak German. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Da, the land of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Is that really where he's from? He's from Austria? Yeah. I didn't know that either. <laughs> yeah, from the, the, the town of Linz. I think it's on a border with, with Bavaria. Hmm. Yeah. He, uh, he served in the Austrian army. He knows, he knows how to operate a battle tank, an Austrian battle tank. And I think they're T-72s Russian. So there you go. Uh, Alberto said, Adrian, if we hadn't been a king in England we wouldn't have become Protestant. Um, but if y'all didn't have a king in England, what would be the alternative? Like that would be, that would be the question, right? So then you have to say, okay, well, we'll have a, a Catholic Republic, I suppose is one, one option. And if you have a Catholic Republic, what's to stop the same situation happening there? As it is now in America. As it, I mean, as it is in America, except America was never a Catholic Republic. Um, the, the problem here is what St. Thomas talks about when he talks about the, uh, the monarchy and the other forms of government. St. Thomas clearly states that, um, every form of government has the potential to be perverted. That monarchy actually has the least opportunity to be perverted, even though you would, you would think otherwise, but Democracy in the dem a democratic republic is actually a greater chance because now you have the, the whims of the people. And if the whims of the people desire one thing, it's kind of what we saw with Luther, where they started influencing princes and the princes started turning. And these things would happen because they were trying to uh, get the groundswell of people to turn against the Catholic monarchs. This was happening all over the world until we have uh, the republics. And then what do we see in the republics? Well, the French Republic destroyed the Catholic monarchy and destroyed the Catholic faith. The, um, the same thing we see in America, what, is, what, ha what has re a republic done for us? It has created a democracy where we can vote to say that abortion is good. We can vote to say we can mutilate children. The, the morality becomes the whims of the people in a, in a democratic republic. And so if you can keep the people good... Well, then a democratic republic can work. But if it doesn't, then it becomes very, very concerning. So, yeah, it's bad that King Henry VIII turned. But you also notice how many kingdoms had that happen to them. It was actually surprisingly few. And there were bad monarchs in kingdoms in the past. Um, the Habsburg Empire had bad kings, had anti-Catholic kings. Many countries did. 
Uh, but ultimately, England is really the only example where there was like a complete 180, like permanently. I, I, I think the I don't think Luther persuaded the German princes out of theological points. He did use theological points, but the princes themselves who turned away from Catholicism and embraced Lutheranism and Calvinism, it ultimately came down to money. Yeah. They didn't want to send money. They didn't want the churches to send money to the Pope. They wanted the churches to send money to him. And the same thing with King Henry VIII. What, what did he do? First thing he had, he tasted the authority of power in the church. He liquidated the monasteries. The monasteries in, in England, England, Wales, Scotland, and Ireland, they were the seedbed of the, the rise of Catholicism in the British Isles. They were the root and he pulled them all out and liquidated everything and funded his empire. Avarice. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, I agree completely. The, I think the primary reason was they wanted the Catholic land. That was the big thing. Yep. Uh, uh, Light Z10 says, remember the founding fathers of America were getting away from not only the Rome, not only Rome and the kingship of Christ, but they were getting away from the British monarch as well. That's true. That's true. Um, the Alberto says, new stars don't underestimate your system. I mean, our system hasn't really been tried for very long. That's why they call it the American experiment. And it's, uh, we'll see. We'll and, see. In the, the grand last. scheme of things, that is absolutely correct. We've had monarchies since, since the Pentecost. And before only, Pentecost. I mean, monarchy before, is the yes. natural state of man. It's been around for 6,000 years. They, we've had republics in Venice and, and, uh, and other microstates and, and princely states. And when I say princely states exactly, they, they still had some monarchy in some form. And the Republic of Venice was a convoluted system of checks and balances that would make your head spin. But uh, ultimately, we've had monarchies throughout the world since, uh, since the rise of, of Western civilization. So it's the Republic is a, a new thing. Look at the French. They're, they're, still, they're on their fifth Republic. <laughs> they're not getting it right. And, and they're still having problems. Macron just acted like, a, like an absolute ruler when he imposed that, uh, the new age limit to retire. So there you go. The, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of these things are... Uh... Al Alberto Ascari on YouTube is saying... I would have the Roman system under Caesar. You mean the Republican form or the empire? It's because Caesar heralded the empire, which meant that the Republic was already deficient and collapsing. Yeah. Under which Caesar? I'm assuming Julius Caesar, then, then his, his adopted son, Augustus Caesar. Yeah. And that, if that's the case, then that's empire. That's, that's monarchy. Empire. Yeah, yeah. That's monarchy. But if you mean, uh, the later Caesars, then it was kind of a, a weird, um, the Republic Alberta's uh, clarifying. Yeah. The Republic. Yeah. It's kind of like a, a Republic mixed with a, uh, emperor. But, um, yeah, I mean, interesting. Patty says America is a great Catholic Republic. How is it a Catholic Republic? Can you explain that? Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. Like how, how could it be Catholic if it's not Catholic? Like, <laughs> like it's like, uh, the can is there even a single Catholic state in America? Nope. I mean, it doesn't exist. I mean, how can you say it's a Catholic Republic? Um, the the biggest thing that you could say is that Timothy Gordon position, which is like, oh, there is a uh, it's a it's a crypto Catholic. It's it's Catholic in its in its ideas in its philosophy, which which doesn't make it Catholic. It makes it uh, it makes it based off of Catholic philosophy, but all the goods of modern of modernity is um, is based off of Catholic philosophy. Like people talk about Judeo Christian values, which I think is absurd because it's not it's not Judeo it's it's Christian values. They're Christian values, not Judeo Christian values, because Judeo refers to the Torah, right? Yeah. The and so those laws of the Torah were perfected in the New Testament. So if, for instance, the, for, we have, um, we, they, they, we talked about this with, um, with Steve Ray, there is like the, the whole idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Um, those kind of ideas were done away with by a Catholic nation. 
And recently there was um, Dennis Prager came out in support of pornography because he was like, oh, well, pornography is good. As long as you're doing it with your wife, it's fine. And it's like, okay, well, there you go. There's your Judeo-Christian value. He said, Jews have no concept of a of adultery being in the mind. Adultery is an action. And so it would, if you see it, you're not actually committing adultery. And I'm saying, no, that's that's not a that's not a Catholic position. The Catholic position is our Lord saying, if you even look with lust upon a, with a, a woman with lust in your eyes, then you have already committed adultery in your heart. Now, they, they don't have those positions, as stated by thought leaders in the Jewish community. And it's very clear. So it's not, it's not right to call it Judeo-Christian values, but instead Christian values. And by Christian, we mean Catholic. Uh, Patty says, Chicago, Boston, New Orleans, Philadelphia, New York City are all Catholic. What do you mean? I think I think it what do you mean dude largely populated by cultural Catholics maybe we, there was a moment in the 50s where they could have enshrined Catholicism in city and county laws but that moment is gone yeah I mean that's not even it even wasn't a thing in the like New Orleans yeah New Orleans was historically um but even even some of these other cities they uh Chicago Boston Philadelphia Chicago was very Catholic uh for a while um, New York City, though, hmm. there was a lot. I, there were a lot of Catholics there, but they were severely persecuted in New York. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much political power they really had. Tammany Hall. And also, that's that's one, two, three, four, five, five cities. But there was no state. There was not a single state. That some people argue uh, Maryland, but it really was not. That was when they were a colony, and that last didn't last long. Once Queen Mary died. Let's see. New York City is one of the largest Catholic archdiocese. Brooklyn was once called the city of churches. Today, mostly cultural churches. Yeah, I mean, today, I mean, they're they're all horrible. We we're just reading a story about <laughs> yeah. New York. Uh, Where priest. is that Paulist church? Is that in Manhattan? Uh, I don't know. Look it up. Let me know. Yeah. Um, find out. Find out. Find out. Is it a Paulist? Is yeah. That who it Paul, was? Paulist. Yeah, the, find out. Let us the know. The home church of the Paulists. Uh, Lizzie Tennis said, "I understand what Patty is conveying." Um, Chicago was and is very Catholic, dismissing it as cultural as if that is nothing, is not appreciating how powerful culture is. No, by cultural, I mean, like, it has, it's not even, like, it's not even faithful. It's not even faithful, because what do we see in the, like, it's, it's purely cultural, meaning, oh, yeah, I am a, uh, I am a German in Chicago, therefore I'm Catholic, but it has no effect on your actual life. Uh, how many people in Chicago how many Catholics in Chicago attend Mass every Sunday? I'd be curious. What's, what's that number? How many Catholics in Chicago that attend Mass every Sunday believe in all the teachings of the church? Among all the people who believe in the teachings of the church, how many of those people are actually trying to, uh, are trying to, to evangelize and trying to change the culture to be Catholic? So that's what we mean when I say cultural. I don't mean that it's imbued in the culture in the cultists because that's just not true is that we there is no cultural there is no culture of catholicism in those state in those cities it just doesn't exist if, if those cultural catholics actually lived out their faith this country would have been catholic before adrian or not or i would have been born yeah for sure yeah i mean if if every single catholic in america acted like a catholic we could convert the nation in, overnight yep and f in one or two election cycles boom easy Easy. Easy peasy. And yep. it, uh, if just the politicians alone, yep. if all the Catholic politicians who were, because there are a lot of politicians who are Catholic, then they would have, uh, they would be, they would be practicing the faith. They would yep. be, they would change the culture. Patty said this, that is a trad canard. The term culture is a slight and displays ignorance. Explain what you mean, Patty. How is it a trad canard? I need you to explain what you mean, because uh, you're saying that so you're saying I, I'm wrong? That that what I say, okay, what did I say that was incorrect? Explain to me. I'd be curious to know. I mean, with your definition, then this country is a Catholic cultural country. Well, that's what that's what they're saying, right? <laughs> but they said America is a Catholic country. Everybody wears their their green uh, green patty shamrocks on St. Patrick's Day, and then they go have tacos on Cinco de Mayo, and and. Uh, then they go and uh, sell up and open Christmas presents for Christmas. I mean, if that's all 
cultural. That's being, if you practice your faith, that means you would think and vote and act out your faith, not just open identify to, as Catholic. Correct. Yeah, Teresa said, I think I've asked this before, but I haven't looked it up. I will. I remember hearing he was instrumental in the language somehow, tweaking meanings. Have you heard or do you recall this? Um, George Soros, she means. And here's another way. If we actually acted out our faith, we would not have to need so many government services to help the, the poor, the hungry, the naked, the, star, the, the, the mental illness on the streets. There would be so many apostolates and ministries out there helping and serving the poor. Uh, I'm not, we will always have the poor, but it, it would be much more effective than what's going on now across the country and in each individual city and state. Yeah. And so the, here's the thing. Okay. Patty says they did act out the faith. There is a reason St. Fulton Sheen was so powerful and there's a reason abortion was illegal for so long in America. Uh, Fulton Sheen's not a canonized saint yet. Um, but he's venerable, venerable Fulton Sheen, uh, was so powerful. There's a reason abortion was illegal for so long in America. Uh, well, abortion was illegal everywhere in the world. Um, so that just was, I mean, anyone who has a basic morality knows that abortion's wrong. It doesn't require the country to be Catholic for it to be, to be legal. He, he, Adrian, I just got uh, a message across my news ticker. This is... A Cardinal Dolan right now speaking out on what's going on in New York City. Hold on. here I got okay. the actual audio. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Father Charles Cologne was Catholic despite his Americanist bias. In fact, he was ignoramus concerning the founding fathers. Um, I don't know anything about that. Uh, let's see. The, if Catholics were building treasure for the kingdom of heaven, we would not be asking what is going on in this world. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I, don't, I just don't understand how you can think that America is a Catholic nation because uh, just look at our country. We support transgenderism. We support wicked things. We have um, the uh, homosexual marriage, so-called marriage is, is legal in the country. Abortion is still illegal in, in most of the uh, countries in America, oh. most of the states in America. He, uh, the communications department from the Archdiocese of New York just wants to clarify that that message also applies to Father James Martin. Nice. So I, I just don't, I, I don't understand, Patty. I don't understand what you're saying. Even during the time of Fulton Sheen, the Fulton Sheen was trying to convert people because there was a lot of non-Catholics because the, there was not this milieu. Like, just watch the interviews. Go listen to all the interviews with, uh, with Buckley, William Buckley Jr., and not just with Fulton Sheen. I mean, I mean just generally, because he kind of had um, a discussion with the, uh, the people of those times, the people in politics at that time. Watch his interviews and see oh, what the culture was like. Yes, his interview with Michael Davies uh, when he had him on his show. Oh, yeah. That I was about that. Oh, that was inc I learned so much from just listening to Michael Davies. Oh, yeah, that was a good interview. Uh, right when Vatican II came out and, and it, it, what he said, it happened. Happened then. Ha it happens even more amplified today. It, incredible. Patty says, transgenderism has been a thing for two days. History is far older than your short life. No, but it's a, it's a point about, well, first, America is only 200 years old. So it's a very young, it's a young nation. Uh, second, so two years is a long time for, for America. If it's, a, if it's 200 years, That's two true. years is... Uh, is like what two one percent one percent of the country for a country like um spain two years is like nothing but for uh america it's it's one percent of the of our, of our time here but uh the point is and so you think about like no like no fault divorce has been a thing in america for what 70 years yeah and so that's like a fourth of our country's life um it's more than so i mean those are those are the things uh see patty says there are two americas protestant and catholic Philadelphia's example was a powerful Catholic city-state. It's informal, but places like Philadelphia where affect city-states. You're claiming America was never Catholic. You are very, very wrong. Okay, I mean, if you think so. I, I don't see how you can say America is Catholic. Uh, can you show me a document, any document, saying that America is Catholic from from an American, an American Catholic, an American um, document saying that it's a, it's a Catholic nation? I'd be curious. 
And I'd be curious also, I mean, obviously, if you're saying that there were Americans who were Catholic, well, obviously, if you're saying that there were Americans who are good Catholics, well, clearly, that's the case, clearly. But if you're saying America as a country is Catholic, and that's just simply, there's no document, no evidence of that kind of thing being a thing. Anyway, we'll be back tomorrow. We'll talk about the Texas shootings and all those things that are happening. We're definitely praying for, for those intentions. It's horrific. Uh, but God bless you. God love you. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget.